in co All righty. You're live. Welcome to Black Man Lab. <laughs> we are live here Monday, uh, September 14th. I almost forgot what day it is. These days keep rolling into one another. I'm um, so glad to be back. Last week, we took a week off uh, for the holiday, uh, but we are back and better than ever this week. I have a great topic that we are going to be discussing tonight, which is um, making money virtually. Um, for, our, for our young folks, um, one of my brothers who's on with me today, the co-host is Joe Barker, and me and Joe have been talking to our young folks, and one of the things that they wanted to hear about was how do we make money for in this virtual world? Um, with that, let me just go ahead and give a quick introduction of Joe. Joe, say hello to the folks. How's everybody doing tonight? It's so good to uh, be with you guys again. We, um, you know, I know this topic seems like it may have been a reoccurrence of something we talked about a little earlier. We talked about the stock market. We talked about on uh, day trading and so forth. But that's just one of many different ways where you're you're making money in this virtual environment. So we have some good brothers on with us tonight that are going to open open that door a little bit wider open with that uh, broader discussion. So glad to be here with you guys this evening. Thanks, Joe. And uh, yeah, we have a great group uh, tonight to talk about different ways of making money virtually. A um, little background round on Black Man Lab. Black Man Lab was co-founded by Maoli Davis, uh, attorney Maoli Davis, my longtime buddy, um, who's like a brother from another mother to me. Uh, and and Maoli, uh, as a member of Let Us Make Man, they um, stepped out and wanted to be able to provide their boys with some different voices. We know as fathers that uh, sometimes we struggle with having our own boys listen to us and they oftentimes will listen to, you know, somebody different, an uncle, a close friend, so on and so forth. So that's where it started at. And um, it just was originally a small group of young men, uh, but it's grown today to over 200 people. We've had as many as 250 people in the room when we meet live. Um, obviously, with COVID, we haven't been meeting live. We've been meeting virtually um, and via Zoom, which has actually worked out for us because we're able to have brothers from all around the country partake and uh, listen in as well as be on the panel. So that's been really beneficial for us. Um, one of the things that we do every week is that we make sure that we are centered and grounded in this space, being open to be able to take in this information that we are going to provide tonight. And... Uh, really kind of letting go of you know, whatever heaviness that this world can put on us as black men. Probably let that go so that we are open to be able to take in information and grow, all of us. Those of us that are, that are hosting this event, those of us that are panelists, and obviously those that are listening in. Um, so with that, I'm going to ask Joe. Um, Joe, if you can get us centered, I'd appreciate it. Absolutely, absolutely. So let's just take a couple minutes here. Now, as, as Marty said, normally we're, we're in a space together and we, we call it a safe and sacred space. And one of the things that we do there is we do this centering, but we also allow it to be a space where brothers that may have had a, a hard week, um, you know, we just love up on them. We, we hug up on them and we, we're there for them in this space. And so it's a little bit different space here, but we all are still navigating through uh, a challenging 2020 with so much going on and so much that we've tried to address. So we're going to keep it simple here as far as our centering. Many of you all, your centering may be meditation, maybe prayer, maybe walking, uh, going to the nature reserve, but we're just going to take some deep breaths tonight and bring everything in and let it go. So what I want everybody to do is on the count of three, we're just going to take a deep breath, breath in and on the, then we're going to exhale it. And we're going to do that a few times and turn it back over. So on the count of three, Let's take that deep breath in. One, two, three. Now let it out. Let it out. Let this that roll out of you, off your shoulders, and relax. Relax. And let's let's do that one more time here. Just to take a deep breath in. One, two, three. Breathe in. And breathe out. 
and just center yourself. Let the calmness take over. Let the universe speak to you in the space that we're in. And let's hear what these brothers have to speak with us tonight on. Thanks so much, Joe. Appreciate it. I see we also have one of our other our other um, Black Man Lab members on, Brother Fred Parham. Brother Fred, how you doing today? What's going on, Marty? I'm listening to Joe do my thing, Joe. <laughs> I hope I did it a little justice, brother. Oh, my God. Yeah. Hey, man, it's great to see everybody. Great to be back to the listener audience, man. I'm, I'm excited about a great show, all the panelists. Glad to have you here, Thank Fred. You. I didn't know if you were going to make it in time, brother. Hey, would you bring the ancestors into our space? Can you do that for us? Sure will. Um, Thank you. So yeah, I'd be honored to talk about our ancestors and uh, as you said, invite them into this uh, safe and sacred space. And so we began by our international ancestors whose names that we do not know, who uh, lived and died upon the African continent, uh, free and uh, self-determining. Then those ancestors who fought during the Maafa uh, as they you know, went through the Middle Passage and so we call the names of those ancestors who we do know who fought both on the continent of Africa for our liberation and self-determination as well as throughout the African diaspora here in the Americas. People such as Nelson Mandela will lift our fist and say Ashe. Uh, yeah. People such as Winnie Mandela, so we'll say Ashe and Ashe. Ashe, uh, Ashe. Ancestors whose names that you may know who were born in the US or in some of our national ancestors. Think about those ancestors, both men and women who fought uh, during the enslavement for our freedom with both an armed struggle and in the courts of the US. So men and women like Frederick Douglass, I say. Sojourner Truth, I say. I say. And then those ancestors in our family line, those ancestors who are directly responsible for our presence here tonight, uh, being able to see and hear under this US flag. <clears throat> those ancestors in our family, please think of those ancestors and call them into this space. Um, and one Ashe. Ashe. And then lastly, for those yet unborn, those Africans who we are working for with this panel and all of the other work that we do um, in these United States, those young children yet unborn whose dreams that we hold dear to our heart, we say Ashe. 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 And Ashe. Ashe. Oh. Ashe oh. Thank you, Brother Fred. Appreciate that. We know that we are standing on the shoulders of all those that came before us. So it is important for us to acknowledge that and to bring that spirit of those people into this space so that we are open and we are willing to take on this information and continue to grow as a people. So with that, thank you brothers, appreciate that. Let's get right into it. I wanna introduce um, our panel tonight um, and, and uh, get into our, our questioning and, and into the subject matter at hand. So first up, um, I'm gonna just reach out to each of you brothers and you can tell a quick snippet about yourself and what you do, and then we'll get into the questioning. So brother Cole, can you introduce yourself? Absolutely, I'm uh, very excited to be uh, on this virtual stage with uh, this great this great panel. So thank you guys for having me. Uh, my name is uh, M. Cole Jones. I am the uh, managing director for Rise Ventures, uh, managing partner there, um, as well as the executive chairman for, for Game Breakers. Uh, Game Breakers is a uh, collaborative agency crafting the narrative of gaming as a lifestyle. You know, so we amplify pathways for brands, institutions, and individuals to get into the uh, gaming and esports space. Outside of that, I've been a serial entrepreneur, uh, a serial entrepreneur and investor as well. But thank you for having me. And appreciate having you here. And that's, that's, uh, Definitely a space that some of our young folks are very interested in. So glad to have you on the panel. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Um, brother Toussaint, you give yourself, yourself an intro. This is a brother from Chicago, my, me and Maldi's hometown. So uh, he's not far from where we're from. So give an introduction to yourself, brother. You're on mute, Toussaint. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's all right. Can you all hear me now? Can you hear me yes, now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 
All right, I'm Tucson Warner, owner and founder of Calumet Creative, which is a, a boutique marketing and design firm. Uh, and just recently, within the last year, I, I, I started up a podcast in reference to this conversation. I started up a podcast, and I'm at <laughs> like something like 250,000 uh, viewers a week. So, uh, you know, in that vein, I'm becoming a public personality, you know, but I leverage the podcast to create more, create more energy around my design firm, but it's turning into, you know, something totally different in itself. You know what I mean? Awesome. awesome. Thank you, brother. And that's, uh, you know, that's the creative piece that we have as a people, right? Sometimes we find a lane that we didn't know was there. The next thing you know, that becomes who you are, man. So good stuff. Look forward to talking about it. Last but not least, my man. A uh, member of uh, Let Us Make Man, as well as Black Man Lab, and one of our go-to people for all that is what we need within Black Man Lab and, and uh, Let Us Make Man, my brother, Eldridge. What's up, El? Man, what's up, baby, man? It's a, it's an honor. I said when I got on here, it's always an honor when the brothers let me get on the mic, man. Uh, <laughs> so my name is Eldridge Washington, a serial entrepreneur, uh, but today I'm going to be talking about and representing the Jess Elder Media Group, and we are a media platform. Uh, I'm so excited to hear the brother say he started a podcast because the podcast game is what we're in and producing podcasts. I have my own podcast that I have, and I produce about seven or uh, 12 other uh, shows as well behind the scenes. So super excited about just sharing how Black people more than ever need to use their voice, their story, and their experience to make money online. Good stuff, Al. Glad to have you on as a panelist, man. And I trust you, brother. I know you won't say anything too crazy. <laughs> you know, that, that's that's what Al's thing is. He always worries about, man, I don't want to say something that's going to put somebody off or anything, but we know we, we got you in a good space, brother. We good. So thanks for being here, man. Um, I see that my brother, Miley Davis, is here. Miley, you want to jump on and say a quick word before we get started, brother? Man, just excited to see you, brothers. Um, excited to hear from you. You know, we get phone calls every day at the firm. You know, we've had to adjust our business model quite a bit in order to uh, make sure, you know, we keep people safe under these conditions. So from having 20 people in the office at one time to having about seven or eight and then rotating folks and having them work virtually, you know, has been a new thing for us. So uh, I'm just looking forward to learning. Um, again, we just give thanks because what we want more than anything else is for our young brothers and sisters who are out there that are able to watch to just know that uh, we are grinding on, on every front, you know, getting it every which way we can uh, without, you know, violating the law, just doing the work. And so I'm, I'm thankful, excited. And this is, again, just in the in the spirit of Black Man Lab. You know, we've been at this now for uh, over four years of just trying to build with young people, build with other brothers. And so this is a beautiful thing. So thank you brothers for being on. I'm gonna lay back and listen, watch and learn as I uh, try to make it to the make it to the house. So appreciate you brothers, thank y'all. All right, bro, drive safe there. And uh, with that, let's get it started. Joe, you wanna jump in with our first little inquiry? Yeah, let me let me do that. Let me do that for all three, um, all three brothers, man. Um, again, we've kind of had some preliminary uh, discussions as to a particular industry. Once you know, COVID hit and the pandemic and so so much um, turmoil that we've been dealing with throughout the summer, so much strife. But you know, I, I want to know before we get into specifically what you you do, or that may be part of it. How did COVID-19, how did quarantine impact you? And is it something, did you have to pivot to do what you're going to be talking about? Or is this a space that you were already in? And, and let, let, let's start with uh, you, Brother Toussaint, and let's just go around. Uh, it was kind of a both and for me, right? Uh, one, like I said, I started the podcast kind of to promote what I was doing professionally anyway. But in COVID, what it did was give me an opportunity to put more time toward the podcast and the numbers grew at a rate that I couldn't even imagine. So in that vein, you know, because I was spending more time with the podcast, it was kind of a pivot, even though I was already dibbling and dabbling in the lane, you know what I mean? So my increased presence in the podcast space started to create other opportunities and avenues to create, generate capital, you know? Okay. 
what, what's your podcast, you sound? I'm just about to ask, what is podcast? It's called I Said What I Said. <laughs> uh, featuring Tucson Warner and Herb Howard is on the What's In It For The Black People media station. Okay. And well, what do you guys kind of go over? What do you just, what, what's it, what's the Man, baseline? It's, it's really all things black, right? It's, it's a racially driven, politically driven uh, social commentary. And, and, and we've been kind of tagged like intellectual thuggery because we approach it from a, a vantage point that you probably don't hear in that space very often. Uh, <laughs> it's intellectual conversation, I guess you could say kind of uh, formed through a neighborhood kind of commentary. You know what I mean? Uh, but if you have any understanding of Chicago, right? Chicago's a very, how can I phrase this? It's a very segregated town, uh, but it's also very politically driven, you know? Mm -hmm. And when you start thinking about, like I, I made a living in the arts, essentially it's graphic design, but it's still the arts, right? And we start thinking about the thriving communities in Chicago, you will make most of your capital in like politics and government and it just kind of works that way. But because it's such a segregated place, man, you'll find it is very difficult as a black man or black person in general to find cadre in that space where you can make a living off of these kind of industries. You know, if I'm being honest, it might be two brothers in the space that are eating, that are really living off of design and art. So, you know, you just gotta be more creative and find a ways to force the hands, the powers to be to open the door. And we start thinking about the levels of segregation in the city. When you th start thinking about just the, the energy of race right now nationally, right? If you can push the needle, specifically in regards to a government driven town, are they gonna come talk to you? You know, mm. some contracts started opening up immediately. Like even though I'm talking about the podcast from a digital space, it started opening up contracts with government. It started opening up doors for me to do more uh, contracts with government. So even though I was using the podcast, it translated in different spaces. No, no, don't. Good can stuff. You, can you name the platform you said you were on again? What's in it for the Black People Media? All right. Eldridge, I know you look, you, you immediately looking that up, aren't you, bro? Oh, man. <laughs> nah, nah, I love it because, you know, are you exclusively on that platform? Uh, we're leveraging all the other digital, you know, networks like Facebook or Instagram and all that type of stuff too. Yeah, uh, but it's also got some, some terrestrial airplay as well. Perfect. I love it. I'm on it. Great stuff. Dusan. appreciate that. We'll get even deeper into that as well. I'm sure. Um, brother Cole. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so for me, um, it's, it's a both and. Uh, situation as well. So my, uh, so with Rise Ventures, uh, basically Rise is an acronym for Reimagine Innovation in Sports and Entertainment. Uh, uh, part of our business model is that we leverage sports venues to generate deal flow uh, for our uh, partners, but also for us to look at uh, making investments in companies. So for example, in the Mercedes-Benz Stadium, we have a fill-over suite that we program and activate game day and non-game day. A uh, very different model, but most of your sports venues are trying to figure out how to be a destination 365. So, of course, you know, we're getting ready for Final Four, excited. Uh, the client work is building up. It was going to be a great uh, a quarter uh, for us. So we uh, scaled up our resources on the front end, and then uh, COVID came in the back end, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know. my Dude, they got a nice suite, y'all. They got that big boy. <laughs> that big boy. We may have to host from there one day. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Right. So basically, uh, anything involving the, the sports venues are, are really just up in the air. Um, a lot of changes. With our, with our proximity so close to the, uh, to the field, basically, um, our suite isn't available at all um, for the season, no matter what. So they can move us around, but we have the best seat in the house. You just, right. you know. <laughs> so now, so on, on that side of the uh, business, we were impacted, but we already started talking about ways to uh, diversify the business model, you know, pre-COVID. So some of the things that we've done were uh, as early as 2016, 2017, started paying more close attention to the uh, esports and gaming landscape. So um, back in 2008, 2009, I opened up the first gaming uh, center um, at a major theme park at King's Dominion, you know, mm. and then with my corporate innovation firm in 2013, we built a uh, gaming platform for AT&T 
valued at north of, north of 30 million. So I was always close to the gaming space. So things just kind of came back full circle. So uh, when, so COVID put a big spotlight on uh, the gaming industry uh, and then the streaming and uh, curating content, just period. So um, from that perspective, uh, we were able to kind of double down our focus and resources around that, around the gaming ecosystem and be able to do a lot of uh, impactful things. Uh, and very excited about the different things that we are doing. Uh, we've launched the uh, first ever HBCU Esports League, uh, partnering with the largest streaming platform, uh, which is uh, called Twitch, uh, which is owned by Amazon. Mm -hmm. Got a great partnership with them. Uh, we got some, some really big announcements coming out uh, just this, uh, this week. You know, I, I may even do a spoiler alert or something like that. Uh, the, I'll send a text message to make sure I can uh, I can speak on it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it, it was definitely a both and situation for us uh, and uh, for a lot of the clients that I work with as well, just having to pivot, you know, and uh, actually looking at how to generate revenue virtually was really at the core of it, especially for our nonprofit um, relationships. Appreciate that, Brother Cole. Appreciate that. Yeah. Very, very yeah. Good yeah. stuff. And that that's... um. That's I'm, I'm sure going to be a common theme as you talk about the both and right yeah. is that pivot piece. Um, you know, you see your business going in one direction. You kind of have a plan and then something like COVID comes out of blue that you had no clue about. And so now it's like, well, I can't just I can't just throw it away. I got to figure out a different way to get it done. And, I, and that's really what this is about. You really want to make sure that we are um, letting people know, allow your creativity uh, especially us as Black folks, we have had creativity be a part of our our DNA because it's had to be, right? Um, and sometimes we, we suppress it um, because of different societal norms. But you know, folks like you guys that have um, really opened yourself up and looked at different ways to do it are the ones that are super successful. So, um, again, great stuff, brother, and, and really want to dig deeper into that as well. Eldridge. Yeah, man. So I keep the I keep the thing going both and, but it's a little different in the sense of um, when COVID hit, because I, I also do business consulting and well. I consult with a lot of small businesses, nonprofits, you all know that, uh, on just brand strategies and uh, helping really people translate their brands from an offline to an online experience. And it's crazy. It's like when COVID hit, everybody that was kind of like devaluing the the uh, online landscape, they called, like, so February, March, like May, those much start really, that start really getting busy on that end, just kind of helping people get organized, especially in the church space, right? You can imagine how many churches that were not set up for this online streaming thing because they didn't feel like they had enough members and it wasn't valuable to now, if you're not online at all, you're losing. So on that end, it got busy. On the podcast world, listenership was really strong. And what I was doing was paying attention to the podcast landscape. So I'm listening like, all right, boom. View, listenership is going up, but where it hurt us, quality is going down. Because a lot of people, one, didn't own their studio like we did. So they didn't necessarily have the equipment in place. So a lot of where you usually hearing crispy mics, you're hearing Zoom call interviews. You know what I mean? And then... Also is going to the interaction of people. I'm an energy guy. So like not being around to actually engage with people in the studio, that definitely shifted the flow of how business was. But ultimately, I think it uh, COVID forced us all to become innovative. And uh, and in a lot of ways, if you really depend on who you are, like Mowley said, his office, they go from 20 people in a building to seven. That's an opportunity to downsize and save on revenue as well. So we are we all figuring it out. So at, at the end of the day, we made it over with this hill we're still climbing called COVID. Appreciate that, L. And, and as we pass it on over to Marty, I know he's going to come up with um, some things to dig deeper. I just want to thank you all for those answers because one of the things that's so critical is some of the young men that are in space with us, that are listening to us, that are following us, they're trying to figure out what am I going to do? And some of the youth that we mentor or, you know, one or two decisions away from making the wrong decision, right? 
and being in an unproductive space. So it's really great to hear you guys say that it's not an either or, it's a both and. So these young brothers that are listening can recognize that, hey, it, it may not always be the, the, the easy choice, but you know, it's something that people, they can see that they know that are on this uh, uh, conversation with us, they can see that have done that, man. That's, that's critical that they see that practical application of how you guys have moved in this space. And uh, El, I just want to say with you, man. I know, uh, you know, my my wife looks at you, man, like like you, Tommy, man, from from Mark, man. It's like I don't know quite what you do, man, but we know you hustle, bro. Talking about you earlier today, I said, yeah, I think El's gonna be on with us tonight. She's like, oh, I might have to listen because I don't know what he do, but he always hustling. I said, hey, that's that's what that's what black men have to do, babe. That's what black men got to do. So thank you, brother, for the words. Appreciate y'all. Hey, so tell, tell your wife, man, my, my, my inspiration is on call. I'll be watching M. Cole, bro. M. Cole, that guy said, if I'm Tommy, I'm cold, but he's smart. Noted. <laughs> I appreciate the shout, man. Thank you, man. <laughs> Good stuff, man. Good stuff. So um, <laughs> I'm laughing, man, because that, that's absolutely true about L, man. He'd be like, I don't know what this brother does. But he might as well have some wings on the way he moves Absolutely. around. Um, anyway, uh, what I want to dig into, guys, a little bit is, is where did you start at? What, what was your original plan and what transformed you to get to where you are? Um, I, I, it's, it's, I think, very important for us to have that um, kind of a conversation around what was your original thought? You know, what did you think that you were going to do? Um, professionally early on and what got you to where you are today um and I'll, I'll start with you brother Jason. Uh, my original plan was to live off the land like Jesus you know what I mean that was my original hope <laughs> but, uh, amen yeah but uh you know I think I I came up under an entrepreneur my father was an entrepreneur so you know I knew what that looked like from a financial space and I kind of was against it early on in life. So I took on the job immediately after college. And then I realized that I'd rather roll the dice myself, you know? So just like a lot of the brothers on here, and even like you all were laughing about L, uh, I'm kind of the same story. And I would assume that most of the brothers on the call would probably be the same story until they settled in. And based on, you know, the changing of the times, like we're, we're, we're legitimately a different demographic, right? We got, the internet was invented in our lifetimes. Right, so the world is shifting, you know what I mean? And it's shifting again as we currently talking, right? We're moving into a space of artificial intelligence. So if you're not adjusting, you're getting left behind. It just kind of is what it is. There's, there's no other realm to operate in. You have to adjust all the time or you will get left behind. You know, we are uh, in a presidential election cycle and I remember doing the primaries, uh, the, the, the Asian brother Yang that was on, on, on mm -hmm. the stage was talking about in a, uh, basic income right universal basic income and it was amazing to me how many people thought that was just an, uh, an absurd idea but if you understand the digital landscape you better start considering those kind of concepts because where people are traditionally used to making capital in those fields are being eaten up they don't they don't already don't exist you know you go to the grocery store there's a self-checkout line that's whether you look at it as such a night, it's still artificial intelligence, right? It's a job gone that usually, you know, supplements our community. Uh, when you think about the ATM, it's a job gone that usually supplements our community. When you do the, when you get to the raw data of it, specifically for black people, there's only like 2% of black people working in the private space. So when you think about that contextually, that means that the vast majority of the income that comes to our communities is all government driven jobs. Well, that's driving a bus. That's being a police officer. That's, you know, those kind of jobs. When well, you think about the new, the, the, the latest Teslas, right? You, you could call your Tesla to drive to you. You know what I mean? So if they already have that technology, how far do you think it's going to take for them to get to bus drivers driving buses without actual operators or driving trains without actual operators? And then you start, or, or even mail for that matter. When you think about how Amazon works and, and, and the, and the uh, post office is the greatest employer of black, black people in America. So when you start thinking about those contextually, you got to know that we're, we're approaching a kind of an awakening we're gonna have to have as a community. What does it look like to be black in America when those kind of opportunities don't exist? Mm -hmm. So our entire lifestyles has to be driven by 
how can I adjust to the moment? You know, I was born with a certain skill, which was art. You know, it just is what it is. I've been an artist all my life. So how do I take this skill level, master it, and take it to a digital space where I can uh, maximize my potential, right? Maximize my distribution, ma maximize my uh, 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 visibility. You know what I mean? That has to be the question that we always will have to continually ask ourselves for generations to come. If you're not in this space, I don't know how you survive. Hmm. Well stated, well stated, brother. Appreciate that. Appreciate that, brother. Um, brother, brother Cole. Quick, quick you... question. Oh, quick question. Ahead, how many hours, as you all share, how many hours do you work a day? What time do you get up and what time do you go to bed? Because these young brothers and sisters throw the word entrepreneur around for freedom and they think that that means waking up at noon and, you know, being done by four and kicking it all night. And I just would like for folks who have, who are doing this, who are on their grind to, you know, give, you know, give some context to that work to that grind? Uh, uh, it is no off time. You know, being quite honest, you become, you might change your master, but you're still a slave to, to something. You know what I mean? Uh, so I'd rather be a slave to my goals than to somebody else's goals. So there is no off time. I wish I could give you some hours that I work, but I, I legitimately, when I, my eyes open up, I'm working. And right before I fall asleep, I'm working. You know, it's just, it's just kind of how it works. You know, it's an all day process. You know, it's ain't no weekends off. You know, when I go on vacation, my computer goes with me. You know what I mean? It is what it is. You know, vacation is really just a change in setting. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but that's that's my experience. I don't know everybody that, else's experience. That dang computer. <laughs> right, right. You know. Yeah. Um to answer both questions, definitely um you know, entrepreneurship, you know, you, you have to factor in, you have to schedule time to, to press pause, you know, uh, otherwise you literally can't work around the clock. Right. You know, I, I know, especially when I was first building, you know, it was sun up, sun down, sometimes sleeping, um, you know, you know, in the office. I'm just being honest. It's not necessarily, I'm not communicating necessarily the best of habits, but, you know, um, um, it, 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 the grind was serious. Uh, now, when you love what you do, you know, it's a little different, right? Uh, but, you know, one thing that I did had to learn how to do was try to factor in time to, uh, to sleep, uh, to eat, um, to be present for my significant other, my, my, my now wife. <laughs> you know, it, 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 was, it, was, it was tough, but I had to schedule those things the same way that I schedule anything else um, to, to make sure that I, I kind of mix things up. But when you're building, you always sacrifice, you, you often do sacrifice, sacrifice more time to uh, put towards, you know, building your company, trying to get to where, you know, where you need to go, especially if you're bootstrapping your company, especially if it's basically not something that's funded, it's basically just funded from your time, your money, your sweat and tears, you know, so uh, time is money, you know, um, and from that perspective. Um, uh, in regards to my journey, uh, so, I'm, uh, I was a marketing brand and strategy guy, you know, before I got into the technology space. I couldn't even spell technology at the time. Uh, but <laughs> hey, one thing I had to be honest about was what I was good at, right? So I, I had to really, you know, be honest about, man, what skill set can I give to the world, right? Um, that is, that best represents, you know, my best self. And it was marketing, brand, and the storytelling. I'm like, well, shoot, what, well, how is that gonna play out in the tech space, right? Tech is there's coding, there's development, there's all of this stuff, right? But uh, every company needs marketing, brand, and strategy and storytelling. And the more I started digging into technology, a lot of your technologists, your technical individuals, they don't do that great of a job of telling their story, right? Trash. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so. I saw that as an opportunity, you know, back in 2010, 2011, where I can give my skill set to the tech ecosystem to give back what I needed in return. Uh, and, and it worked out for me. That was my journey, right? Again, being honest about what I'm great at, 
and giving it to the ecosystem, right? Providing immediate value. So therefore I had the license to be able to uh, ask for help and support in the areas where I, I were not, uh, in the areas where I wasn't great. So I surrounded myself with folks who were experts in other areas and that allowed me to build my first company, Cavallo, which was a collaborative growth company. So that's basically how my journey, you know, you know, got started. Just I, I encourage our young kings and queens, you know, to, uh, you know, be honest about what you're good at, and don't be afraid to amplify and project that particular skill set, and give it into those areas and arenas where you want to get involved in. And as we dive in more about, uh, you know, making money virtually, uh, definitely happy to share a few different examples of how you can take your skill set. And, and do that in this this new pandemic environment. And I'm, I'm so glad I'm so glad you said that, bro. Like really honing in on your skill set. So it directly how I got started. So um, I just I've naturally my personality was my strongest asset, uh, and my personality I learned really well transferred over to sales, transferred over to deals, transferred over to really getting in the room. So my start. Have, I was born, like, I was brought into internet, uh, internet 2.0. Internet 2.0, they say that's like the 1999 era. And there was a platform called Tripod. I don't know if y'all remember Tripod, but Tripod is like what Squarespace was, WordPress, WordPress is. Before all of that, it was Tripod. And I had a cousin, this dude was just uh, super smart, super good at just building websites. And like, I was like, bro, let's do it. Let's just sell some. And I remember us uh, trying to sell my dad. Like we tried to sell my dad a website and we went in uh, asking. So we went in, we agreed that we were gonna ask for like $300 for this website. But I was inspired, I got excited. I got in a meeting, I asked my dad for $3,000. And of course he said no. But first lesson to my entrepreneur that's out there, do not be afraid to ask for the money now. Uh, ask for the money early, ask for it now, because if you uh, go through your life waiting, you'll realize, because once I did start making money, I realized I could have been asking for it a lot earlier than I actually started. So the internet is where I first got started, just building websites and stuff like that. So it's right now, it's a lot of young people right now. And I, I work with a lot of kids in schools and this kid with 20,000, 10,000, 50,000 followers and they broke. I'm like, bro, do you know that's, that's, that's a check right there? Uh, there's a book written by Brittany Hennessy. I want y'all to check it out. Brittany Hennessy, Hennessy like to drink. And the book is called Influencer, Building Your Personal Brand in the Age of Social Media. In that book, what she does, she just breaks down how, like her job is literally writing six figure checks to Instagram, models, all the people that be wondering how Instagram models get paid, it's because of this sister. I flew her in from New York and we had a workshop at the gathering spot before the pandemic hit. Um, but she just breaks down how you get paid for giving people attention. There are business owners out there that want to put their brand in front of other people and they don't know how. There's business owners that don't know how to use Facebook, don't know how to use Instagram, things that are coming natural to y'all. So go call some business owners up, like show them how to do it, show them how to engage, how to get involved. So for me, how I got involved, I just realized I seen the internet coming. I seen social media. This is when I knew social media was about to be serious. Cause I remember they were trying to play it like it was all like just a kid thing. But then I seen McDonald's make a Twitter page. Then I seen Walmart make a Twitter page. And I'm like, why are these big companies making this if this is supposed to be a child's thing? And that right there was the only thing I needed to see that this was about to be bigger than what people thought it was. And now the internet, we don't, back in the day when we used to want to uh, get somebody quote, we would put microphones in front of them. What do we do now? We read their Twitter. The Twitter is the new press conference. So it's just like, I'm just telling the young people, man, get started with what you have. Like, don't, like, you don't got to have all the podcast equipment right now. You ain't got to have a whole e-gaming system. You got a social media page and it's a business owner that uh, want to sell their product to your audience. Try it. That's, that's my advice right there. And that's how I got started. I think those, there's some good gems there, Eldridge. Um, first and foremost, ask for the money, right? Um, that's, that's a big issue that we have. 
as as people is that, well, I'm not there yet. I don't have enough people that want to back me. Well, you never know if you don't ask, right? That's one piece of it. But the other one is, you know, for these young folks, there's so many that are out there um, of you that are out there that are um, having some following or you want to have some following. But then even if you do, what are you doing? Right. And that's a big piece of what I wanted to get into, too, is that, um, you know, these there's these young folks that are getting these followings, but not necessarily doing anything. with them. Um, Brother Toussaint, you, you, you know, kind of, like you said, transferred over into this pod, podcast world. And that's a perfect example, right? You said you have how many followers now? Uh, we're doing something like 250,000 views a, a week. Wow. And so that translates for you, right? Into some sort of monetary piece. Mm -hmm. And that's the piece that we want to get to, right? So how, did, how, what does that look like? And all three of you guys, I'm sure can answer that. What does that look like from having people to look at you um, on your podcast or whatever your social media is to becoming um, um, dollars? Uh, you're able to monetize the platform because essentially what it is is, is, is marketing, right? It, it just breaks down the marketing, right? So imaging and messaging dictates behavior. That's just what it is. So there's not a company in existence, existence that doesn't want a piece of that. You know, if you can dictate or influence like the, the, the author of the book that the brother was talking about, if you can influence behavior, then every company that's in existence wants a piece of that. So they'll pay you for it. You know, it really breaks down that simply. Uh, but even before I got into the digital space per se, you know, as a graphic artist, you know, when you start thinking about your main employee, it is marketing companies, you know what I mean? And from that vantage point, you understand that, like I said a minute ago, the imaging and messaging dictates behavior. So in a lot of ways, man, when I think about specifically young people who have this wealth of, of influence in those uh, social media spaces, I kind of wonder how they're leveraging it. Right. And it's not just in regards to like money. And even in, even for those people who do leverage it for money, we all should start to question how they leverage it. Right. Because what we got to understand is that the digital space in a, in a lot of ways, it, it, it takes away. Well, the product becomes the person. Right. You become a product, essentially. You know what I mean? And there has to be some level of compa compassion attached to that, because if it's just money driven, if it's just money driven, and we know, like a lot of people don't fully grasp marketing and marketing is a science, you know what I mean? Uh, if we don't really pay attention to the compassion part, we become drones to the computer. We become slaves to the computer. We become slaves to the digital space. So I, I, I get why we're here, right? And in a lot of ways, what we're trying to push is that here's an opportunity to make capital, right? You need capital to survive. but. I also want to, specifically when speaking to young people, man, there's a there's a moral clause that we got to put into it, into the conversation, specifically for the new generations coming up. And again, I'm from Chicago, right? And, you know, we all know the brand of Chicago, right? If you're outside of Chicago, you definitely have a, a certain view of what the brand of Chicago is, right? And, and, and in, that, in that media space right now, specifically that social media space and specifically that youth space, you know, drill music is a very popular form of music. And drill music was crafted and composed right here a couple of blocks away from my house. You know, and outside of Chicago, we might see drill music as just a, a genre. But inside Chicago, you know that they're leveraging social media to sell concepts that are attached to death and murder. That's just true. You know what I mean? The storylines are played out like uh, uh, soap operas on social media. And they're making a lot of money from it. Yeah, I, I hate to say that, but it's true. You know what I mean? So there has to be some level. It just can't be about, if we're going to influence somebody, let's influence them to do something worthwhile. Even more worthwhile than making money. Because legitimately, you can see that the world is shifting. And if you are a major player in this position, you have the power to shift the world. Let's influence to do that. You know, so it's just, it's just something I thought about as we was having this conversation, because everybody's kind of honing in on how to profit, right? And how to profit is great, right? But there has to be a, a moral uh, attachment to that because profit isn't good enough. You know what I mean? Again, like I said, these young boys are, are profiting. They are. 
That young boy mm-hmm. that are not over 25 years old walking around with millions of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars, but they're selling death, but they're using the digital space to do it. Sure. And that's that's a that's an excellent point to you know kind of part of what we do here at Black Man Lab. We deal with um, professional development and then self-development, right, as well. And and I'm glad you brought that up because um, what we ultimately want to see. Everybody wants to make money. We get that. Everybody wants to be happy making their money. We get that. Um, but at the end of the day, um, we want those people that are making that money to also be in a position of true leadership for our community. And what you're talking about right there is, you know, people that are making some money, but are they leading anything? Absolutely. Right. We, we can be honest and say that. Um, so uh, we want to make sure those folks that are listening in have that level of understanding that, yeah, the money is cool. Everybody on this panel has made some, some probably decent coin in their life. You know, but at the end of the day, um, it's about what you're leaving our our, our community and our, our world. Right. So I, I get off my soapbox with that. But uh, Joe, did I, you have something, man? Yeah, I did. No, that's a good point, Marty. And and I, I hate to take it further, but I wanna I wanna unpack unpack that a little bit because you know we are here to kind of hear about, hey, how how do we make money in this virtual world? At the end of the day, different spaces for different people, but that engagement with our community has to be across the board. So Tucson, Brother Tucson, I appreciate kind of what you were saying, and I'll open this up for either any of you all to answer, um, because that space, I'm part of a mentoring organization, and and Marty and Molly know uh, very well. Um, you know, Next Level Boys Academy. And when the, the protests and everything were going on this summer, I'm out there with Maui and I'm out there with Marty and we're doing these things. And the, the, the CEO contacted me and said, hey, Joe, what should I do? You know, I, I feel I should be out in these streets. I feel I should be doing X, Y, Z. I said, no, that's, that's not your space. You, you have a diversion program. This is what you're doing and you're doing it well. And that's how you support, that's how you bring in and take care of the community. So what I want to ask with, with this vision that you all have in this virtual world, you're making this money, how do you engage the community at the same time and make sure that you're in a space that is either bringing young brothers, young sisters along, advocating for them? How, how, do, how do you incorporate that into your efforts as money is what, you know, it's going to be a byproduct of what we do, but at the same time, that can't be the end all for everything. And I'll open this up to any, any of the three of you all. Yeah, I know I can jump in real quick and just say that's half the reason why the Just As a Media uh, platform was created. Um, because social media is all of social media is just a conversation. And uh, every is the Internet is very loud. Right. You're hearing a lot of different things, but very rarely are you getting if if conversation or information is our diet. Uh, we're not really getting enough protein. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. If positivity is the protein. And that's what Just Elder Media wanted to do. We wanted to create, uh, we see the podcast, like podcasting is right now, podcasting is where Facebook was when it was only college students. Okay. People know about it, it's popular, but it hasn't opened up yet. Podcasting is getting ready to disrupt radio the way Uber disrupted taxis. Hmm. Uh, so it's about to be a completely game changing thing. So for me, I got in that space because I see where it was going. I see where it was about to be. And I want to be a part of the reason why we got some voices that we need to hear on these platforms. So there are some political voices that we need to hear. It's, it's funny, anybody that's involved with the Black Lives Matter movement or any type of organizing, I could arguably pinpoint any real protest or any real organizing to about a group of 20 people. It's about 20 people in Atlanta. If they're involved with it, it's probably the real deal. Right. And for Atlanta to be that big and for the real organized world to be that small, it lets us know that we need more people involved. And how do you get more people involved is by putting more information out there. And the media is the best space to do that. And um, I just decided to come through the podcast space, but there's other ways to do it as well. There's through video content and blogging, and we do a little bit of, more of that as well. But podcasting is just the lane that we wanted to stick in. So that's kind of where we are, is just trying to put as much protein, positive information out into this space as possible. Thank you, brother. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. Anybody else want to weigh in on that? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll chime in. So um, I, I definitely, uh, uh, 
you know, agree in all the points my good brother mentioned. Uh, when you think about esports and gaming, there is no esports and gaming without the community mm-hmm. at all. You have to uh, be a part of the community. You have to build the community. Even with my previous experience from 08 and 2013, I still made sure that I cultivated uh, relationships with the you know industry leaders within the space. You know before I tried to do the things that I wanted to do, right? You know because that particular community is so grassroots that you come in the wrong way, uh, they will cancel you. <laughs> you know the the esports and gaming community is not driven by uh, uh, commas and zeros. You know it's yeah. about just having a great time. Now, of course, you know, you do have some of the challenges, you know, um, in, in the industry, you know, but, but at its core, it's very community driven, you know. So um, when you think about, you know, monetizing that, you know, you have to be consistent with your gameplay. And there's different ways that you can actually gameplay within the uh, within, within esports and gaming. Now, something I want to point out that's very unique to our community, right, is that there are things that we are currently doing day in and day out that if we leverage esports or gaming fundamentals, we can monetize. Uh, right now, uh, while, while we're on, uh, the uh, uh, young kings and queens that's watching us, uh, maybe going back and forth between their Xbox, PlayStation, or, or some mobile game on their device. That's fair, right? Now, uh, imagine if they just turn the switch on and they were recording their gameplay. Now, a lot of times when they play, they play with their friends. They can record their gameplay with their friends. And um, it can be their gameplay, if it's good, that folks fall in love with and decide to follow them or subscribe to their channel on one of the many platforms. Or it could be their commentary. It can be their conversation, you know? Uh, and, and, you know, by Given that to the community, they will communicate to you what they enjoy most. Oh, I love when you guys are chatting about, you know, uh, current events, when you guys talk about sports. And, and you'll look at the comment sections and you're like, you know what? We should do more of that. So when you listen to your community, you begin to kind of build a cult-like following. And it's not saying that you have to have two million followers. You want them engaged, whatever the, whatever the number is. Right. right. You know, so... Um, building a community is, is key uh, um, within this industry. And the beauty of it is that what, the, what esports and gaming is showing us is that you don't have to be a, a hardcore gamer to maximize what that ecosystem is making available to you. Uh, if you think about the platform I mentioned earlier, Twitch, uh, Twitch is heavily marketing to non-gaming industries, music, uh, fashion. In fact, uh, I think it was Birdberry who just announced their fashion show is going to be live streamed on Twitch. You know, mm. so 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 many industries are beginning to gravitate towards these platforms because of the uh, the reach, the global reach these platforms you know have, and the and the ability for you to easily be able to uh, you know monetize. Uh, and actually have access to monetize simply with what you already have uh, at home, Sim- simply what you already have on your device. You know, so that community aspect is very, very key when you're thinking about streaming and even content creation, uh, whether it's on your PC, your Xbox, or your mobile device. And this is this is some great content that we are having tonight, man. I'm loving this conversation. I'm loving the information that you guys are providing, man, because this has been some of the stuff that Joe and I have been hearing that um, the young folks out there want to hear about. And so this is great. Um, one of you guys, I think it might have been you, uh, Brother Cole, that, that talked about um, having somebody to listen to, somebody to mentor you, somebody to uh, you know, kind of kind of follow um, in, in doing the work that you're doing. Do, do all of you guys, and this is a general question, have all of you guys had that? And what would your suggestions be for the young folks out there to do the like, to do the same thing? I'll start with you. Uh, yeah, so 
So um, my advice would be um, whatever you're whatever you're good at that you want to do, uh, you know, find somebody who's great at it. You know, study them, you know, and pull from them what you think that will be best for you. Now, while you are exploring different aspects of what you like about them, keep your eye on them, but, you know, try to, you know, create your own, you know, version right. of how you want to go about executing that, right? It doesn't have to be identical to the person, but having inspiration and a reference point is, is key. Now, um, something that, um, that El Elridge mentioned earlier, man, is it's, it's so difficult because it's so, it's so loud, right? You know, like... Um, it, it was cool to say, oh, just Google it, right? But now when you Google, there's so much information. Uh, what is a trustworthy source? Uh, who is credible, right? You know, um, and, and part of it is, you know, whoever resonates to you, you know, um, just uh, stick to them uh, for like 90 days, right? You know, study anywhere from one to three people, what they do, what they're saying, um, and do it for 90 days and see what the outcome would be. Right. Um, and sometimes we do take uh, the importance of, of mentorship or just uh, looking up to someone. Sometimes we take that for for granted. Uh, and, and sometimes it is difficult to focus because there is so much noise, you know, but um, I would recommend creating tunnel vision, uh, identify one to three people uh, that you respect and admire in regards to their craft, pull anywhere from, you know, three to five or five to 10 things that they are great at that you want to begin to incorporate and don't try to do everything at one time. So, you know what, I'm going to try these three things for three months and see where it goes and, and be focused and be diligent um, about focusing on those, uh, on those three things, because there's going to be so many distractions. You may have a, a friend who goes viral the next day and you're like, Oh, no, oh, man. I mean, I got to figure that out. I, I got to do what, you know, I got to do what Sean did. You know, right? you know, but in order, a uh, viral is viral, but uh, sustainability is long term. And the best way to be sustainable is for you to uh, perfect you know, and practice. Just like sports, you got to practice. You got you to perfect your, your craft. And you can't do everything at one time. You know, just like, you know, when you had to learn how to drive a car, you didn't just get in and, and understand everything. You had to take it in steps and phases. The same thing about trying to monetize the virtual community. You have to take it in steps and phases. Great stuff, brother. Great stuff. Brother Toussaint, what about you? What do you think in terms of um, uh, having a mentorship for folks? Or, or what do you think young people should do in terms of um, finding their lane? Uh, I think the, the importance of a mentor is invaluable, right? I'm 44 years old, and I still seek information from brothers that are older than me and that treasure different paths. It's just part of the, the nature of being human, specifically of being human and male, I think. You know, uh, but in regards to all the brothers that said the space is so loud, in a lot of ways, I think that's the value, right? I think in chaos, there lies opportunity. Mm. You know what I mean, uh, I was just having this conversation with a friend of mine about myself, you know, in most people's eyes, I'd be seen as, I am seen as radical, you know, uh, 10 years, this radical voice wouldn't have had a platform where people would have wanted to hear it, right? I mm. didn't change for the world. The world changed to fit for me, right? But the say, thing, say it again. Say it again, brother. The thing about it is I stayed consistent and true to myself. You yes, know what sir. I mean? So 10 years ago, people were sitting in a, a, a conversation within the garage or a living room be like, man, you out your mind, right? 10 years later, it's like, man, that's genius. That's brilliant. But I stayed the course. You know what I mean? I got a friend that's a, a, a Morehouse grad. Right, and again, I said I'm 44, so to get some context to age. But at the time that he was at Morehouse, him and a couple of my other partners were like the most popular rap group in all of Atlanta, even including Outkast, right? Maybe more than, a little, more than 10 years ago, 20 years, because that's college for us, right? But there's a video of him having a party and all of the Atlanta celebrities that are now celebrities, that weren't celebrities at that time, were looking up to them. You could see it in the video. You could see the admiration for these guys in the video but they didn't stay consistent. Now everybody knows who Outkast is, right? Gucci Man was in the video. They was laughing at Gucci Man. Now everybody knows who Gucci Man is. And I'm not saying that product itself is a product that I would align myself with in regards to like Gucci. That's just not my thing. 
but his consistency eventually paid off. There's a Jay-Z line that says, I can sell water to a well. One of the things that the internet provides you, what the digital space provides you is, if you stay consistent, your community will always find you. Mm. It's just the truth. Yeah, mm. yeah, mm. it's true. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you you uh, you uh touched on some good points there. One, one of which is um, the, that last one. You know, we, we have to stay on whatever that is that you thought was going to be your thing. Be inconsistent with it and staying on it, but we so often get pushed away because of, as I said before, societal norms. What we think are societal norms. Other communities, they do it all the time, right? When I say other other folks, they do it all the time. That's how they're just built, you know. But our our communities have been so um, disenfranchised that we have a tendency to get away from that, man. So I appreciate that, brother. Brother L, you want to jump in real quick? I know you have a ton of mentors. Um, and, and it's helped you to be where you're at. But let's jump, jump into that real quick, and then we want to get to habits, rituals, and disciplines. All right, so real quick, three mentors I want every young person to get. The first mentor is that literal mentor. That's someone that you actually know, someone you can touch, someone you can talk to. Um, Y'all know uh, I consider Mowley one of my mentors, Marty Joe, Derek Bozeman, all these brothers my mentors, and how I got mine, I just showed up every day. I didn't ask for permission. I didn't ask you to be my mentor. And Mowley said, Mowley met, I'm 30 now. I met Mowley when I was 22 years old. And uh, we were talking about this a few nights ago. And when I seen them, I seen what I wanted in them. And I said, I'm going to just be there regardless. I showed up to every event. I set up, I broke down. And one thing I learned that leaders are addicted to dependability. So if you can become a person that people can depend on, they will always call you. And I just made myself dependable. So that's the first one is that finding that literal mentor. The second mentor I want you to find is that lateral mentor, that person beside you that's in your age range. They're kind of in the same level you're in, but they're grinding. They inspire you and you can still learn from them. Issa Rae said it. We need to start working lateral. Quit always trying to reach up. There's people that's beside you that got a skill set that you can use. Last mentor, and that person could typically be found in your uh, your school, you know, when you go to college, something like that. The last mentor I want you to find is your literature mentor. That is someone that you can't get to. You don't really necessarily know them, but they have wrote blogs. They have wrote books. They have wrote teachings that will show you everything that you need to know. Uh, a book I want to uh, encourage every young person to read because regardless of any industry you're in, you got to know how to sell. There's a book by uh, David Hoffel called The Science of Selling. The Science of Selling, Proven Strategies to Make Your Pitch, Influence, Decision, and Close the Deal. Um, you need you got to close the deal no matter what you're doing, however you're making money. You got to sell. You got to close the deal. So get, those are the three mentors, the literature the lateral and the uh, literal mentor. And my ritual habits and routine that I do every day, um, honestly, I try to call someone, I try to make two calls a day. Somebody that I just love, like a family member, because that gives me inspiration. I do all my work for my family. So whether it's my mom, my grandma, my aunt, a cousin, I try to call one family member. And then I try to call someone that I respect, not because I need it, need them, just to check up on them. Cause there's another book called Dig Your Well Before You're Thirsty. And a lot of times we're only calling people when we need them. So I just try to call on people randomly just to check. That's kind of like my ritual that I do every day. And my relationships are the um, strongest asset I got. And that's why they stay strong. Appreciate that, L. That's, that's great stuff, brother. And we love watching you, man. We love watching you grow. We love watching the work you do. Um, Brother Dusan, how about you, your habits, rituals, and discipline? Marty, hold on one second, man. I think L just, just quoted Lisa Ray. I think she uh she used to have it in for him back back uh, a couple years ago. He he tried to get on Twitter and do it too much and uh she had to blaze him. But I had to, I had to I'm sorry, I had to jump in on that. Hey, hey, hey Molly, we weren't gonna get we said we weren't gonna get L in trouble today on hey on Zoom, look man. he quoting us, so you know he he making it all good now, but I'm just saying <laughs> me and was a, have that was a moment <laughs> they masked up a little bit. Lisa Ray yeah. wasn't with it. 
Yeah, you said, right, we good now. We talked on the phone. We good. Nice. We good. That, that's cool. Good. That's dope. That's dope. <laughs> well, you need to get her get her to uh, host our Key Lumbo um, uh, fundraiser dinner then. How about that? <laughs> I don't know if we that good, but we good. Uh, <laughs> African, African Center Schools, man. She got to support African Center Schools, you know? I'm hey, all I know, ahead. man. Here you, here you go. Here you go. Having one of your, your side ahead. conversations. Go ahead. Man. Go ahead. Go in ahead. The, in the middle of Black Man Lab. This is too good. This is just too <laughs> good. Y'all brothers are killing it. Go ahead. All right. I'm sorry, brother. Uh, I kind of I kind of lost the questions. Habits, rituals, and what else? Yeah, yeah, exactly. See what Molly will do to you, brother? Oh, <laughs> uh, habits, rituals, and disciplines. Just things that you do. What we want to do, man, is make sure that we're giving young folks out there and anybody else who's interested. Um some things that you do on a daily basis that help you to continue to move forward in your successes, man. So we know that you don't do those things without having some, some habits, rituals, and disciplines that you do on a daily basis. Man, read, brother. Read and seek information, you know. Yes, sir. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned my father in this conversation, but if I didn't, in regards to mentorship, uh, I was blessed just to be born to that man. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the things that he did to me early on in life was he forced me to read like an hour a night and it became a labor of love. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, and not only did I read all the time, but every time I got into his car, he forced me to listen to public radio, you know? And I hated all of this when I was a child. I hated every moment of it, you know what I mean? But as an adult man, it served me so well because information legitimately is the key to power, you know? And uh, what you start to realize is that when you have... Reading is a skill set. Listening is a skill set. And when you have those skill sets, you start to realize how many people don't have those skill sets. And like I said, in the midst of chaos lies opportunity. And if you're, if you're, if you're armed with the information, you can wield it through those chaotic spaces. So always seek information. Uh, for me, and this is just me, I'm, I'm probably more dedicated to information than anything else in life. You know, it, it, it allows me the opportunity to transition in those spaces, you know what I mean? It just, it, it opens up doors, you know? Seek awesome. Well, oh, appreciate that, brother. Uh, brother Cole, what about you? Oh, man, I, I, I love this question. Um, and um, I'm gonna be a little vulnerable here, you know, as a, I was the kid where I would be upstairs when I was supposed to be doing my hour of reading, I'll come back down and be like, like, mom, I'm done, right? You know, so, Fast forward today, you know, I got to read something two or three times before I really understand it, right? Because I short change myself. Now, I'm giving this example to say uh, to, our, to our young kings and queens, no matter where you are, you know, don't think that, oh, man, because I'm not an avid reader that I can't, uh, I, I still can't read, you know? So, yeah, I'm getting better with the physical reading, but you give me an audio book or a podcast, that, that's me, right? You know, but I totally agree with being able to consume you know, information and, and content. I just wanted to tell, uh, I just wanted to hit on from a different perspective, right? You know, because you know, all of us, you know, have our own journey to where we are today, right? You know, so you can turn any obstacle into an opportunity. Uh, now in regards to a ritual or a cadence for me, um, uh, one thing I want to share to our listeners is that um, affirmations, you know, mm. I, I am healthy, wealthy, and wise. You know, I am healthy, wealthy and wise. And when I say these yeah. affirmations, I, I visualize, you know, how I am healthy. You know, I visualize what that means to me, what that means for my families. I, I visualize, you know, what does uh, uh, the wealthy aspect, the wise aspect in regards to my, to my ancestors, right? And I visualize that and the energy that it does for me, you know, when I take those deep breaths, like the exercises that I feel Brother Joe uh, walked us through earlier, Man, it, it's powerful. And what happens, it becomes subconsciously, it becomes a part of who I am. You know, it, it really does it for me uh, in regards to helping me uh, uh, set my day off. So I wanted to share that uh, aspect of my routine, you know, with our young kings and queens that, that, that's listening in and for anyone else who's listening in. That's awesome, brother. I appreciate you sharing that. I appreciate the vulnerability. Yeah. Um, we, we always call Black Man Lab, a, a safe and sacred space for black men. So, you know, that, that fits right in line with what we do on a daily basis. Love that you talked about, um, you know, the affirmations. We actually have, um, Black Man Lab has a, a affirmation that we recorded of, of 
bunch of brothers doing affirmations because I'm we believe about to post it right now. That's awesome. Because we believe in it so much. We believe in, you know, making sure that we are actually saying those things to empower ourselves, man. Um, listen, we are over time already. Um, and we we are gonna close out here. I just want to thank you guys so much for this powerful, powerful um um, session that we had tonight. Uh, we talked about a lot of things. There's some commonalities there that I think that we may have to bring you all back in on um, for, for another session, one of which is we talked about um, sales, selling, how we sell ourselves, because that's a very important piece of business that you do no matter what. You are doing that, right? You have to sell um, yourself. And so often we hear that word selling and it has a negative connotation to it. But um, I think it was your brother Tucson who said that it's still right. It's it's something that you know you have to have a learned way of doing it. So we should probably talk about that as well uh, on another session. Um, I want you all also to know that we do have some young folks out there that have been listening and learning. Um, I know we got a couple of young brothers that are listening. Uh, a brother by the name of Thurgood Johnson and, and uh, his little brother um, Langston. Uh, these guys are 13 and six years old and getting all this knowledge and they listen on a regular basis. So um, I want you to know that you are being heard and those words mean a lot to these young brothers, man. So thank you. With that, I'm going to bring Brother Miley in to wrap us up. Um, unless there's any, is there anything else I missed, Joe or Fred? Is there anything I missed that we wanted to touch on beforehand? Oh, brother, I, I think we're solid. Uh, Fred, Brother Fred, unless you got some, I think we're pretty solid, man. Just, um, Eldridge, thanks for getting all, and Mark, thank you for getting all their social medias dropped in the box uh, so we can make sure we support these brothers because they're doing uh, great work in the community and great work that's bringing the community together, and we, we, we need to support their efforts. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you again, brothers. Brother Miley is going to wrap us up with, um, we, we have a tradition that we do at the end of every Black Man Lab when we're in person. Um, we get together as a group and do it, and I'll let him go ahead and explain it, um, but I, I feel it tonight for sure. So, Bali, if you can go ahead. Trying to let this train pass, man. You know, I live <laughs> like in the city, in the city. You know what I'm saying? So, the train is just rolling past, man. So, that's a weird, thing. bro. We hear um, yeah. Brothers, you. Brothers, loud and clear, though, brother. Brothers, um, man, tonight was powerful, and and I put it in the in the thread. But I just want to say this to you all, brother Tucson. You know, I'm originally from the South Side. Jeffrey Manor um, and, and M. Cole, man, I've been, you know, digging you through uh, my man, uh, Courtney, for a minute. And then L, you know, you, you you baby bruh here. So the three of you brothers, man, just really did something tonight that I, it's, it's what we've been looking for. The, the content, the energy, it was just all right. I'm going to do my best once we get this up on YouTube, do, do the little edits or whatever we're going to do. I'm going to do my best, man, for us to show this over and over again and, and get it out because because the whole world, all our young people need to see this, hear this, man, because you all um, just connected so many dots. With that, we had a queen mother um, in Jiri Algani who was here in Atlanta who would close out all of our meetings, whether it was a reparations meeting, whether it was a meeting for in Cobra, a meeting in the community. We would close out and she would have us hold hands or what, what the brothers did is that we link arms. So we're just going to take everybody off. Everybody come off of mute so we can do this together, man. We want to link arms. Virtually, we link your arms and uh, you would repeat after me. I am a link in this chain. I am a link in this chain. And it won't break here. And it, and it won't, won't break, break here. here. I am a link in this chain. I am a, I am link, a link in, in this, this chain. chain. And it won't break here. And, and it, it won't break, break, break here. We are links in this chain. We, we are links in this chain. chain. And we won't break here. And we, and we won't, won't break, break here. here. Ashe. 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 Man, thank Great you, job. brothers, again, man. Can't, Great can't, job. Can't thank you enough. We look forward to getting you back on again in the near future, man. Because, um, Information that you all dropped was just priced. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. Thank you, you for man. Brothers, go vote, man. If you're listening, vote. 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 vote.
Go and vote. do your census. Do your census and vote. Absolutely, brothers. And protest. And, and 